Good evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, tonight's Must See Monday with uh, William C. Roden. Uh, I'm going to uh, intro Bill here, then talk through some process stuff, and then we'll get rolling with the, uh, with the conversation. So William C. Roden, uh, to my left here, is a writer at large for The Undefeated. Prior to his time there, he was an award-winning sports columnist at the New York Times for many years. He also was a panelist on ESPN's long-running sports reporter show. He was recognized with a Peabody Award for writing HBO's documentary, Journey of the, Afri Journey of the African American Athlete. He earned an Emmy for writing Breaking the Huddle. And he authored $40 Million Slaves and Third and a Mile, books that spotlight the successes and trials of black athletes. We're also fortunate to, ha to have Bill as a visiting professor here at the Cronkite School and a visiting senior practitioner at Arizona State's Global Sport Institute. Bill, welcome. Brett, thank you very much. Thank uh, you all. Um, first, uh, a process note. Um, the, the way uh, the next hour is going to unfold is basically Bill and I will chat for about 45 minutes. And those of you on Zoom uh, will ask you to submit as you have questions over the course of these 45 minutes or once we begin the, the audience Q&A portion, to just submit those into the chat window on Zoom on the, on the right side of, of your, most of your screens. And we'll kind of capture those. I have an iPad, iPad here. We'll all then kind of review them and ask Bill the questions. But, um, Bill, we're going to start with what else? Uh, coronavirus. Um, it's, it's a story that at times is hour to hour. Right. Um, right. E each, each day sometimes feels like a week. So how can we as, as journalists, particularly those who do commentary like yourself, really get our arms around this story and provide that proper perspective to the audience on, on a story that's so quickly developing? Yeah, well, Grant, you know, I thought you were going to start with uh, the, the Cardinals getting DeAndre Hopkins. You know, that's that's one way to, that's one way to shift the conversation. Let's just deal with sport. Uh, you know, I mean, everybody's heard the same response. Every journalist said, wow, this is wild. This is weird. You know, we're kind of getting beyond that. It, we're in the reality now. And as, as, as columnists and commentators, part of our, uh, our job is to try to bring some type of... Uh, uh, clarity out of chaos or some type of plausible explanation. Uh, in, in our business, obviously, this is unprecedented. I mean, this is really unprecedented. I mean, you know, you had, uh, I think, what, 1994, you had the baseball strike in August and into the season, but this overnight, this I mean, overnight, this has basically turned a hallowed institution that served as a babysitter, that served as a uh, safety blanket, that served as a um, uh, as a diffuser, as an escape. Is that all? The, overnight, uh, it was taken away, and so now um, it, it's it's a challenge in, in our industry. Um, you know, you look at uh, you turn every sports channel, you know, the, the reruns. You know, uh, but but it's really forced journalists, uh, sports journalists, to kind of create their own shots. You know, um, we can't just rely on on the games and to kind of riff off of that. This is this raises so many fundamental questions. Uh, uh, primary, which is not just in our industry, but how is this going to change the nature of sports as we know them? You know. Uh, the whole idea of uh, fanless, fanless games. Um, I literally was, I was in Kansas City uh, last Wednesday, sitting sitting uh, with Bob Bowlesby, who's the commissioner, and Wednesday was you know get it of March Madness, and they had their Wednesday night the Wednesday games in the Big Twelve. In the Big Twelve, so you know okay Wednesday, and, and even then though people said well what are we going to do, and so. He had made the decision, well, okay, we're going to play. We'll, we'll play the games today. and But then tomorrow we're going to go to this new frontier. We're going to go to uh, fanless fanless games, which is a hell of a concept in of itself as well. And I was really looking forward to going the next day to seeing what this looked like, fanless games. Um, and he, 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 we talked and he had to excuse himself. And he came back and he said, the NBA has just suspended the season. And I was waiting for the joke. You know, I was waiting for him to, you know, to, and sure enough, and that was the, that was the beginning. By the time, uh, at, at the end of that day, by the time Thursday rolled around, they had already, uh, Bowlesby had, had uh, 
you know, they, they well, the board of directors basically, uh, su you know, uh, suspended or uh, canceled the rest of the tournament, and then we know the rest is history. So, to answer your question, so what does this mean for, for spectators? What does this mean for us as journalists? And uh, we don't know. I guess my my big thing is. Um, uh, What does this do for spectator sports? I mean, right now we're sitting in 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 an in a you know empty uh, studio, and this could well be the norm, even in terms of uh, uh, athletic contests. You know, where you just are in these uh, you know athletes without without fans. It's just a very weird dynamic. And, and the interesting thing, and I'll, we we can move on. You know, what Bob was saying is that, well, listen, we're getting money from TV. So essentially, fans are kind of obsolete. We don't really need the fans. It's nice atmosphere. But we don't really need them because we're getting TV money. So, and I think that's why a lot of conferences were kept trying to, like, kept playing, you know, without fans. But And, and I think that's, if I'm a fan... You know, and you've been going through all these ups and downs with your team, and what what they're saying is that well, you're kind of a, a luxury item that we don't really need anymore. You know, so you kind of chew on that for a minute. That that what we're talking about is the invisible fan. So that let's start there. <laughs> let's, let's start there. Well, you know, and it's interesting too. I mean, it it, it all happened uh, as. Outside the sports world, in the sports world, it all happened so rapidly. I believe it was was it Wednesday night, right, when Rudy Gobert yeah. tested positive. I mean, you, you look that. Well, that may have been the next day, but yeah. Oh yeah, just, yeah. but within a couple of days, yeah. um, you know, we went from okay, okay. we're new fanless games to the NBA, NHL, Major League Baseball shut down, March Madness canceled, the Masters you know postponed, and you know, and that's just some of it. So right now, it's like, there's basically no sports. So unless you like cricket. Well, yes, but there's, there's certainly no, there's basically no American sports right. um, for the most part. So with that kind of, what do you think, what have we learned about the role of sports in our society now that we've now had a few days without it? Yeah, I, I think there, there, there are two things. Uh, in the first column I wrote, you know, we all as columnists, you know, we're the first draft of history. And the one thing is how we probably just took this enterprise for granted because it, you know, sports has always been. It's always survived. Um, you know, even, you know, 1918, talking about the flu, well, they had the World Series nonetheless. You know, now, you know, a lot of people, not afterwards, you know, but they had the World Series. 9-11, uh, um, you know, we, we were down for a couple weeks, came back. Uh, I think the 89 World Series, there was an earthquake. Missed, you know, kind of missed a couple games, came back. So we're all kind of coming to grip with this. What have we learned? And so I was thinking that, well, maybe we've taken sports for granted. But I'm also thinking, shortly after I wrote this, well, you know, we keep using this whole notion of sports as, a, uh, what it, as an escape and that kind of stuff. Well, maybe it's time for us as a society, as people, we don't need the escape anymore. You know, we, maybe we don't need that anymore. You know, in ancient Rome, I mean, ancient Greece, they were big on heroes. Well, when you grow up, you know, you don't need that anymore. So maybe maybe we've reached the point that we don't really need the distractions anymore. Maybe we've been distracted too long. I mean, we've got a, you know, we've got a, 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 a big election coming. And this is not about who you vote for, but it's about we've got some really serious things on our plate. And had we been all you know, absorbed with March Madness, and then the NBA playoffs and LeBron and this and that, we lose our minds, you know, and we, we, we lose track of things that are important. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, we just saw briefly with Colin Kaepernick, the minute he brought in the protest into the stadium, people freaked out because he was bringing a bit of, you know, people, we're in this bubble here, but there's real racism here. There are people, the, the inequity between those who have and those who don't, the despair is really, really real. And I think that it's, we probably come to a point as a country because we are sports mad that we just need to cold turkey and mainline and deal with stuff that's in front of us. So that, that's, again, 
one thing, but maybe we maybe we don't need any more escapes. Maybe it's part of the problem. We've been escaping too much and too long. We just need to finally stop, turn around, face those demons that have been on our trail and just deal with it. So then to, to that end, because yeah, we've gone cold turkey and this, this shock to the system and obviously understanding, you know, grand scheme of things, there's far greater issues at play and certainly, certainly right now, but at least vis-a-vis -vis with, with sports, I mean, played such a significant role. So then what do you think is, a, is the, is the long-term impact here on the world of sports of when we come back, whether it is the no fans or like, or like you just talked about this idea of sports was our escape and now we don't have it. So, so now <laughs> what, you know, now what, when we come back? Yeah, no, well, let, let's say, okay, let's say short term, first of all, you know, there, there are a lot of people, uh, I, I think one thing to your previous question, what do we learn? Well, we learned how many people rely on this industry, you know, and how many people are getting hurt. You know, people uh, who relied on the Final Four, who relied on March Madness, a parking attendant, the vendors, the people who are selling this. I mean, a lot of people were saying, wow, from now until April 3rd or whatever, you know, uh, we're going to make this amount of money. So that's really hurt. I, it, it was great to see a lot of owners, a lot of people stepping up, whether it's in the NBA, they said, we're, we're going to pay vendors what, what, what you would make. Um, but the larger thing is, what does this do to um, the industry of sports writers and the, and the sports journalists? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I felt like this before during presidential elections. That's sometimes when I've just felt like... Yeah, m meaningless because particularly, you know, when I worked at the Times and maybe even, even now these, you, you can't really talk, get involved in presidential elections if you're a sports columnist or sports writer for that matter. And so I always felt like when Obama was running, you know, you know, the sports, you, you kind of figure that the event is just so, so huge. Sports seems to be really minuscule. And I think this same thing, um, sports, disappears and all of a sudden the people in these studios are like, what do we talk about? You know, now that could be saying something about our lack of, uh, you know, being erudite. Maybe this, maybe wake up lessons for us too. Maybe we need to expand our palate. Maybe we need to be able to talk about more things than sports, not be terrified when suddenly, when suddenly there are no games and whoa, what do we talk about? You know, there's a, there, you know, so, uh, and again, we're only like seven days into this. <laughs> we're only seven days into this. And, but, but I think these are some of the short takes that, well, maybe, uh, you know, fortunately, you know, in my, in my career, I was a jazz critic. Uh, I started off covering education, City Hall. Um, uh, you know, so uh, there's a, maybe a, a, wider, a wider field. But I think if your whole life your whole thing as a journalist was just sports and it gets taken away just like that. And you're like, wow, what do I cover? What do I do? What do I, you know? And I just had a conversation with some of the students at, at my course that I teach here. Uh, and it's okay. Now, let's, this is the time to move without the ball. You know, it's the time to move without the ball. Yeah, I know you've been used to those picks and screens that are the games, but now it's time to sort of create your own, create your own shot. What are some of the other issues at play here. So um, long-term implications, Brad, I mean, it's, like I said, we're eight days in. Uh, all we know is that I, I feel bad for the, in the short term for those people getting hurt. Um, and long-term, do I feel, do I fear for our industry? No, I, I, I think we're definitely gonna come back. The industry will come back. But it's gonna it's it's gonna change. Think about this. I, th I thought so. Now, for I've been doing this for pay since 1972-73. Being in being in front of being before millions of people, hundreds of thousands of people every Saturday, every Sunday, big time high school games, college games, being at the Rose Bowl. I mean, every Saturday and Sunday, being around hundreds of thousands of people. Same thing indoors thousands of people, you know, um, and, you know, I'm sure there were people who came to the stadium who had the flu or had a cold or had 
something. I mean, you didn't have 19,000 people in Mexico who got all healthy. <laughs> you know, uh, and so I'm thinking either we've been just stupid and silly and really lucky, you know, uh, you know, or I'm not sure how to, what this, so maybe when we come back, now all of a sudden we're like freaked out because we said, well, maybe we have been silly and stupid and lucky. So now we really have to, you know, the hand washing, the sand, I mean, all these things. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's quite bizarre, but I, I, like I said, I think we're going to come back, but it's not going to be the same. I don't know what it's going to look like. You know, uh, 19,000 people in every other chair. You know, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, so, so you made the point we're just, you know, we're just seven days, you know, even probably even less than seven days right. into this, and given the CDC's guidance, I think came Sunday about, you know, no more than 50, 50 person gatherings uh, for the next eight weeks, which takes us into early May. Major League Baseball, you know, is, you know, push back opening day. And so we're probably looking, yeah, like I said, at a couple months of this. So our colleagues in sports journalism, you know, it's interesting is, is, is a lot of times there's the, you know, stick to sports right. thing that, you know, pops up on social and stuff. What's your advice to our, to our colleagues in, in, sports, in sports journalism who, you know, still, still got to fill a sports page or, or not or do something? Like, what would be your advice to, to them? You know, I mean, and I don't want to be glib, you know, you know, uh, but I think that you have to dig deeper. This is all forcing everybody, even here, you know, at, at, at the crack, I mean, it's forcing everybody to be creative, you know, to be creative, to go about your do job more creatively. Again, our crutch has been relying on people to play. You know, that's been the crutch. That's been the formula. People play, people can watch, the competition, and we report on it. Okay, so maybe this is something different. Again, I don't know what that is, but I think you have to be stretched. I mean, your whole livelihood can't just rest on uh, these people playing games, you know? Um, uh, and the, I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, I wish I could come up and give you some brilliant, oh, well, you should... Uh, become a political comment, you should just switch to politics, right. you know, get a job in politics or something. This is going to come back. It's going to come back. But I think when it does come back, I think we have to um, just widen our vision. We just can't intellectually, intellectually, we just can't be dependent on, on, on games. There's still too many issues. Bring up Kaepernick again. There's still too many issues. There's, 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 there's poverty, there's the wealth gap. Uh, there's so many things. I mean, even, you know, we probably get to this later, but even the lack of diversity in our family. I mean, there are a lot, of, a lot of issues that we've sort of been escaping from that are in our industry, that are in our industry. I mean, uh, uh, this whole idea of all these black athletes uh, in, uh, on the field and on the court, but not in the press box, not in the, what I call the invisible industries of game management and PR and market. I mean, that, you know, so, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe this is a time when we really look at our industry, you know, and, and, and I think that's, the, that's kind of the problem with our industry too, that we talk about race and all that, but we don't really deal, we don't really deal with it. We deal with it on the surface, you know, but we don't really deal with things gender inequity. You know, we kind of we kind of gloss over it, but the real thing is the game. That's the that's the thing. So, um, you know, my advice during this period of time of soul searching is for us to really just go beyond just being sports, right? I mean, dig deep into the, what's the meaning of sport and competition. Uh, what does it mean and what does it say about our society? The fact that we are this dependent and, and matter just like this, we kind of go to pieces. So uh, again, I, I wish I could. Well, no, I mean, you think you have some interesting points though. And also, you know, I think about just in the last day, even just today, driving in and listening to sports talk radio after having listened to it, you know, the last several days. Yeah. And NFL free agency, you know, is again, you know, and and it was like. 
there was almost this like collective sigh of relief, like, oh, okay, now, you know, now right. we got this. Right. And it kind of went back to what you were talking about. And I think you do raise a really interesting point that there are all these issues in sport that you talk to a lot of sports journalists and on the typical time, day to day, stories they'd love to do, but there was a game tonight, right. there was a game last night, they're traveling, they're this. So yeah, I think that is really powerful. There, there's the opportunity for them to really dig into some of these issues and, and deeper stories. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess, um, you know, what, what now with there being no games for two months, for probably a couple of months, um, you know, what, what do you think, what can and should athletes be, be doing now? Athletes, franchises, you know, et cetera, be, be doing now to, to help? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, and I actually was thinking about this even before this happened. In fact, I had a long conversation with uh, Michelle Roberts, uh, who's the uh, executive director of the NBA Players Association. And, you know, I, was, I kept thinking about this new activism. What's the new activism? And I remember it was almost, <laughs> I called her up and said, you know, I think that the new activism for athletes uh, in the NBA and NFL is to turn your attention to voter registration. I think because their fan base is, uh, the fan base is millennials, and I guess what generation, what are they, the next generation X? Generation Z, Z now. Generation Z. And these are your fan bases. I would love for them to use their, uh, their visibility and their platform to really start a register to vote campaign not proselytize, not tell you who to vote for, but to really uh, use that platform to encourage uh, young people to become involved and to register to vote. I don't care who you vote for, okay, what's your party affiliation, register to vote, be engaged, because it's really, really important. Turn out, get engaged. And she was thinking about that first week. You know, she said, well, let's make sure all, you know, how many of our guys are registered. Right. <laughs> but having said, right. you know, assuming, look at the glass half full. Right. Um, to me, that's, that's next level activism. I mean, that's, that's what I think they should be doing. Uh, and also probably just at a more practical thing. When you see this game can be taken away from you like that, make sure all your eyes are, you know, make sure you get that degree. You know, make sure that you've got a second and third pitch. And I think that this generation of athletes, because of uh, people like LeBron, um, probably the late Kobe Bryant, probably Michael, I, th I think people are thinking more in terms of using the game, not, you know, not being the, uh, the tool, but being the carpenter. So I think more people are, are thinking in terms of that. But, you know, this has put a lot of people in, in harm's way. You know, I mean, this is really a serious wake-up call in terms of what are you going to do for the rest of your life when you grow up. So, but, but, but just to get back to your question, I really would like to see more activism, civic responsibility, just in terms of athletes encouraging their fan base to really register and really get out to vote and turn out, not telling them who to vote for. Again, I want to emphasize that, not telling you who to vote for, but just be engaged in the process. I think that would be a great, uh, a, a great civic uh, responsibility fulfilled. Well, and, and to that end, I mean, at, at times, you know, sports has really been ahead of society at large in driving a lot of these larger conversations, like particularly when you look at race, you know, for instance, for example, you know, Jackie Robinson broke the MLB color barrier in 1947. That's seven years before Brown versus Board of Education, 16 years for Martin, Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. Why do you think that is, that sports plays, you know, plays the, the, that, that societal role that frankly has nothing to do with, you know, wins yeah. and losses, miss and made yeah, shots? Yeah, yeah, we, we, we've talked about this before, and I guess I kind of challenged the notion that, I mean, yes, Jackie Robinson was there, but, and it was great, but, you know, they needed, this was war, they needed fresh blood, they needed fresh... Uh, financial streams, they needed new customers, you know, uh, and they needed, they had this whole pool of great players that they needed. So it wasn't totally altruistic. And normally, whenever black folks are involved in being let in, it's normally not altruistic. It's because 
either we're embarrassed in front of the world. You know, I mean, here we, we have, this is the 400th anniversary of the first uh, enslaved people being brought to this country. And a lot of people have just totally freaked out about it because I, I think it's really hard for people to handle that this nation, you know, one nation under God, individual freedom, and all, was built on the backs of slaves. And, 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 and that blood and that sacrifice resonates today in terms of uh, uh, the wealth gap that you see. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, Jackie Robinson, but, it, but, but his coming in to Major League Baseball essentially ended what had been a million-dollar business of Negro League Baseball. So it wasn't, it was, it was like, you know, if, if, if it was tr totally altruistic, they would have said, well, we're not gonna, we're not gonna just take Jackie and all your best players and basically kill a thriving industry that not only was a great business, but it's a business to support other businesses. It supported banks, it supported black newspapers. It's, it was a whole black echo structure. And once you basically killed it, you basically killed black ownership. You set it back. So, yeah, Jackie Robinson, but, you know, it, 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 it kills. So, um, yeah, sports for black folks has been fine, but black folks for sports has been even better. Right. You know, it's, it's built this whole enterprise that's now teetering on the brink. So, um, and I think in many ways... Sports has been really regressive. I mean, I think you're talking about sexuality and the NFL. I think it's still a thing. It's still, you know, kind of queasy. So, um, again, it kind of get back to a question you asked before about what can sports... Well, during this time, we just really need to do some soul searching. And maybe that's the column and the stories that we should start writing about ourselves and about our industry. While we're on this hiatus, you know... You know, let's not escape. Let's, in our business, let's take stock as writers. Let's take stock. Take stock of your newsroom. How many black folks are working there? How many women are in position of power? You know, when you put see these games, how many black folks do you have putting on games? How many black folks do you have in your PR department? How many in your law department? I mean, let's take stock. And, and maybe that's the thing we should be doing rather than be more, what are we going to do? We, you know, we can't. Let's look ourselves in the mirror. And, and, and we as people in the United States, we're not good at looking ourselves in the mirror because it is just too damn horrific. When you look ourselves in the mirror and follow our history and follow the truth where it leads back to 1619 and, and really just uh, the, the, the day by day brutality and horror, I mean, and uh, even, you know, this it's a little off topic, but I, I was looking at this series of uh, uh, that Dante um, James did. It was like a six-part series on American slavery. And, 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 and there was a point where it just showed how fragile freedom was for black folks. And you kind of think of it like today. One day something's there, and one day it's not. One day a guy thought he was free, a black person thought he was free, and then the South said, no, you know, this reconstruct. We, we need black labor. So you were free and now we change the law, and now you're not free. All this stuff is just so fragile. It's all fragile. Not only the sports thing is fragile, our freedom is fragile. You know, our, our freedom of movement, everything is fragile. And it can be taken away just like that. And I think that as people are looking at, you know, I mean, we have to be on lockdown because we're trying to contain this virus, but just like that. So I think there's a lot of soul searching that we have to do uh, and not escape and look this stuff square in the eye. Who do we want to be as, uh, you know, what do we want our sports landscape to look like? Who do we want to be as a country? You know, what do we want to be? Do we really believe in freedom, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness? And do we, are we going to be strong enough to fight for it? You know, I mean, I think this big, you know, we don't need to be escaping, Brett. <laughs> we don't need, we've escaped long enough. I think we need to, you know, stop. <laughs> well, and, and to, to your point of, you know, holding up that, that mirror to, to our business, right. um, you know, 
I mean, frankly, you know, our, our the bids of sports journalism is is it's not very not very good when you look at the numbers around yeah. uh, uh, ethnic diversity and gender diversity. I mean, the Institute of Diversity and Ethics in Sport last year, so players of color, so NBA eighty one percent, NFL seventy three percent, MLB forty three percent. Right. Meanwhile, and this is across Associated Press, Sports Editors, so newspapers and such around the country. 18% of reporters in a study, the same folks, are, are people of color. So we're talking athletes here, right. percentage-wise, and you know, re, you know, reporters here, percentage-wise. Uh, you know, how do you think that that imbalance uh, impacts the the media coverage that goes on? Um, I, I think. Um, I mean, you have fair-minded people everywhere, but I mean, I just think that. Um, you just don't have a full, a full palette, a full perspective. You know, uh, you just need. We need inclusion. We just we're we're better as a. And I know there are people probably we're, we're better as a nation. We're 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 just better when we're inclusive. You know, we're we're better when we're inclusive. When you know, um, there could you know. So I mean, it's just. And we've been we've been having these conversations for a long time. These numbers, I mean, we've been talking about this for a long time. Uh, how is our, and, and actually, our business, the business of journalism, and not just sports journalism, is probably one of the most racist pillars of our society. And that's where a lot of perspective comes, a lot of information comes. You know, even the so called liberal institutions are guilty of the same uh, uh, bigotry and bias and, and exclusion. You know, and it's more pronounced now with the this sort of economic, um, the economic disenfranchisement of so many people of color, and particularly black people, that almost, to get into our business, you almost have to, unless your daddy or somebody or mom is supporting you, it's hard. It, it's just hard to, to get a gig, get a gig. It's, it's, really, it's really hard. So... Um, People have to make a, people who are hiring have to make a concerted effort to look around a room. And when you look in a room and you, you see no women or you see no black people, you see no uh, Latinos, or you see, you know, you say, you know, this, this, is, this is wrong. This is, this is, you know. So you really need people at the, at the, at the top. But, you know, I, we've been talking about this for a long time. We've been talking about this for a long time. And uh, I, I just want one story. Uh, I, I mentioned Bob Bowlesby, who's the commissioner of the, of the Big 12. And we were at a panel. And so, you know, it was like February, Black History Month or something. And we, you know, and I said, you know, Bob, particularly in college, college is probably the closest thing we've got to a plantation. Because if you look at, uh, we, we're heading into March Madness again. And I said, if you notice, when you go into these arenas, the only place where you see a lot of black folks is on the court. But the further away you get from the court, the whiter and whiter and whiter it gets in terms of everything else, all the people doing all the stuff, the stats, the this, the that, that. And to Bob's credit, he said, you know, I did not really, that's a disturbing metaphor. And he said, what can we do, what can this kind of do to help that? And he immediately we established a partnership with this fellowship I run, this Roden Fellowship. You know, well, I only bring that up to say that change, people say change takes a long time. Sometimes change only takes a couple seconds. You recognize something's wrong, and you say, you know what? I'm a white man, or I'm a white woman in a position of power. We're going to change this. We're, we're going to change this. So it's kind of not exactly answer your question, but, but you know. No, but I, I mean, I think it, it does, though, because Parsi, with, like I said, with what you're doing, the Roden Fellows, with the H, students from HBCUs, and then we at Cronkite are working with the Sports Journalism Institute, which for years has worked to help improve, you know, um, gender and, and right. ethnic diversity in, uh, in sports journalism, because I think it has to be an active, you know, and right. it, it, has, it has to be folks taking, you know, an active role like that. I mean, you know, we we were talking before, and I mean, the, the numbers of I mean, the African Americans are, are bad. The numbers of, in terms of win, uh, 
uh, gender diverse are even worse. Yeah. I mean, the Institute of Diversity and Ethics in Sport gave, um, gave an F when it came to gender hiring. 10% of sports editors are women, 70% of columnists are women, 11.5% of reporters. Um, so I think, yeah, it, it's, you know, to some extent we've come a long way and to some extent we've got, you know, we've got a ways to go. Yeah, no, we've got a, a, a real long way to go. Yeah. Let me, let me you go back to a minute uh, uh, to this whole idea of no sports and all that because we, we talked about something earlier today about the locker room, which I, I, I think, you know, the first, the first step of this stuff was for the teams to, the first, the first chip was to basically change the locker room dynamic, you know. Or to eliminate the locker yeah, room. Eliminate, eliminate yeah, eliminate the locker room that, that we're going to keep, you know, no media and all that. And, you know, on the surface, and I know a lot of our colleagues, well, oh, my God, we, you know, what's, we can't do our job like that. And I think maybe that's one improvement. I was never a big locker room fan. It was almost like a sweaty, sweaty slave mark. I mean, it was just almost one of the most unpleasant parts of the, of the job. You know, you got to, you, you know, the game was over, it's sweaty, and then you got to, and, and, and then you've covered a WNBA game, which I like a lot better. It's more humane and dignified. You know, they're not letting guy, you know, reporters in the locker room and with the players in the WNBA and all, all things of undress. They say, wait a minute, you know, you wait, let everybody get dressed, and you know, you, you come out, or when we let you in, everybody's dressed and all that. I mean, that's, it's you, this whole, I think this whole thing of the locker room was just really vastly overrated. I mean, I know particularly the baseball guys, you know, it's like, it's like the holy grail, the lock, the clubhouse is the holy grail. So, well, you know, you'll survive without, they survived a long time without it before, I forget who it was who went to the locker room and got a quote. We could do without it. You'll get your relationships. But I just think that maybe if, if as we recalibrate our practices, that will be one of them. I mean, that, you know, like you didn't ask me, but that I, I just think that's one of the things that come out of this is the whole uh, locker room thing, I think, is just overplayed. I mean, you can have relationships, you know, but it's... it's a lot of it is more of just a pain in the ass, frankly, than it was anyway. But um, so, so, but to that end, we, you and I were talking about this a little bit earlier today. Um, how concerned are you then, though, with the, the t you know, to what extent does this give the teams more control over the message? The rather than I'm in the locker room and I have the off-the-record conversation with you versus um, you know me asking the team to bring you out and and talk to you. Yeah, I mean that is the flip side. The flip side is that. Teams and franchises have always, there are control freaks. The coaches are control freaks, play, you know. Uh, but I still think the players, the players who want things to get out, well, let it get, I mean, and listen, and you got, they got social media now. I mean, they don't necessarily need us to be the, to be the middle men and, and women anymore. They've got social media. They don't really need us to serve that role anymore, which, which almost makes the argument even more about why we don't necessarily need the, the locker room, there will always be players who, if they want to get something out and let you know, they'll let you know. You know, they'll, they'll tell you. The agents will tell you. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I, I think that there's always been this back and forth tug of war uh, between what, what the media, I mean, what the teams want you to know and what we need to know. But we'll find out. I mean, we'll, you know, we will, we will find out. So... Uh, that was one thing that I wasn't necessarily... Now, we'll see when we come back if we go back to business as usual, that, that the clubhouse will be open and, you know, you can go and mingle and, you know, talk to guys off the record. But I, I think there are ways. We have our ways. So we've alluded a couple times now to when, when things come back. So... You know, when, when they do come back, you know, our country, let's face it, is going to be a bit, a bit scarred from, from this experience. So what, what role can sports play in that recovery? And maybe looking at it through that historical lens, because I think many of, our, many of our students either weren't born on 9-11 or they were babies. You know, really the last, the last time 
really remember parts of the sports world shutting down. What is even to as large extent this is going to be, but the last time where sports, you know, hit, hit pause. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I kind of would give the same answer like the Jackie Robinson answer. I think this whole thing has made me think of maybe we're auto correcting, we're correcting because we've gone too far overboard. I mean, sports has become like a corruption. This whole ideal and the, you know, the virtue and all this. Uh, the romanticization. Yeah, yeah. Sports, I mean, yeah. it's just gotten so, like, with the AAU thing, it's, it's such a corruption. You know, it's, it, it's, it's uh, to the point of almost being awful, you know. Um, so, again, you know, I think maybe using this time of, of uh, being off <laughs> is like self-reflection. Everybody from the commissioners to coaches to players saying, well, what are we doing here? You know, how does this all fit into the quote-unquote American dream? You know, uh, all people created equal. Uh, you know, uh, sports has really gone far afield, whereas pure about money. And, e and even this whole idea, think of what, they, think of what people are doing. They were going to have games without fans. Again, that gets back to the beginning of the conversation. Think about that. <laughs> they were saying, listen, it's all good, but we can do it what we can do without you. And we and we're perfectly willing to do it without you because we've got that TV money. So I think that this whole enterprise, and, and I and I I I I love uh sports. I, I mean I love the I love competition. Um I love the opportunity that is given women. I love the opportunity that is given uh, uh, African Americans. It's been great, but it, I think that there's been a corruption. It probably was accent, uh, accentuated with Colin Kaepernick, with how they took somebody who wanted to dissent, uh, who wanted to, uh, to dissent, and who flogged them, basically, blackballed them, and basically killed the movement. You know, that's what sports has become. So, to kind of some extent. I don't want to totally say uh, goodbye because, you know, I do work with ESPN. And right. They, and I do, right, this is what we love to do. We, we, right. do, we do love to do this, so I do, <laughs> I don't want to come, you know, but I like it to come back right. I like us, I, I, I'd like us to kind of move, um, to try to bring this thing back to uh, higher ideals, but not just sports, but a lot of things to a higher ideal. When we come out of this, when we come out of this, and we will come out of it, I'm just hoping that, that the soul search we do um, just brings us to a higher, a higher spiritual level, uh, a higher, um, just, just a higher ethical level, um, just, a, just a higher level in general. But don't bemoan the fact that our sports are gone and we can't escape. Like I said, we don't need to, we don't need to escape anymore. We need to just stop and face this stuff. Um, but at the same time, when you think you back to 9-11, and I admit my perspective might be a little colored by the fact that I grew up in New York and grew up a fan of the New York Mets, you know, the, the Mike Piazza home run. They still have a franchise? <laughs> <laughs> they still have a team? <laughs> uh, I, was a little, I was a little kid when they won the World Series, so I, I guess that kind of hooked me. But, you know, when Mike Piazza hit, the, you know, hit that home run to beat the Braves, uh, and particularly we saw a bunch when he recently went into the Hall of Fame, you know, it really felt like it lifted up a city. Now, now, at the same okay. time, that was 19 years ago. So it sounds like you feel like maybe we're, you know, are we, you know, are we past the ability to do that? Is, is that what you're saying? Well, or? I mean, no, no, I mean, yeah. Or is it, or is it more, you, 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 hope, you hope there's more society can do to recover than just watch a ball wait, game and Yeah, wait, wait, you, you know, waiting for, you know, Lamar Jackson to score a touchdown. Right. No, but but I don't want to. I mean, if you looked at the Super Bowl with, with Patrick Mahomes in Kansas City, it was a great, you know, it was a great story. I mean, it was a great story, and people were behind it. Uh, so I, I don't want to undersell the value of uh, sports to to heal, or or. But I'm just saying it's become so corrupted, right? In in, in a way, um, because it also blackballed Colin Kaepernick. You know, uh, Kurt Flood is being uh, is not in the Hall of Fame. You know because he basically, uh, you know, fell on his sword. I mean that that's another 
that's another musty Monday about Kurt Flood. <laughs> but yeah, I will I will get on that soap opera. Uh, that's that that soapbox. But um, no, I, I you know and and and, and sports and nine and eleven was important. You know, uh, and I I was you know uh, I was part of that group of journalists who, you know, two two weeks later came back to Giant Stadium, and it was somewhat it was it was an act of faith. And, and, you know, when you see 100,000 people at these stadiums every Sunday and Saturday, it is an act of faith and security. But I, I think that some of that faith and security has been shaken. And we'll see when we come back um, whether, whether, it's, you know, whether we've <laughs> recovered it, our naivety. You kind of have to be naive. <laughs> to so a couple more questions for me, and then we have some questions from our audience on Zoom, and feel free, again, reminder to post your questions into the, the, the Zoom uh, chat feature, and we'll, we'll pick up many, many of those as we can. Um, so kind of one, one final point for me on the coronavirus stuff is, you know, when the games return, like you've said, we're, we're returning, it's going to be returning to a different world for all the reasons you said, plus you look at things like, you know, the, the jazz players are all mad at Rudy, Rudy Gobert, who was, di who was diagnosed with coronavirus after he was being quite cavalier about it, including Rummy's hands all over the yeah. recorders and microphones of our colleagues. They have to reveal relationships. You know, athletes in general, you mentioned the sweaty locker rooms are often on yeah. top of each other. You know, not to mention there's this common attitude of invincibility among right. athletes, although I could argue, on, sadly, some of that was reset after the, the, um, the tragic passing of, of, of Kobe Bryant. So how do you see coronavirus changing the day-to-day the -day of sports? Has experience with coronavirus changing the day-to-day -day of sports? Maybe we'll... That, that's a good question, obviously. You know, I mean, look. Uh, during the NFL playoffs, you had the New England Patriots had to take two different uh, flights to their game in Houston because half the team had the flu and all this. So these, I mean, teams have... They, you know, you always hear it. Wow, the team was a lot of the teams. Uh, the Utah Jazz last, you know, half the team was knocked out with the flu and virus. I mean, I think at the very least, we'll think of hygiene in a way. Even now, just through these last eight days, people are thinking about hygiene in a way that you would have hoped that we would have thought about it before. I mean, wash your hands, you know, wash your hands, and you, would, you know, I mean. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I keep joking, all the emails are getting from restaurants about their approach to coronavirus and their, their employees are washing their hands down. And I keep saying, well, what, what were they, they doing, doing before? before? <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. So yeah. we need to all reset. I mean, you know, just basic stuff. Uh, and if you're going to be at these places of 60,000 people, 50,000 people, you know, uh, you know, cover your mouth. I mean, I, I know it's beyond that, but I, I, I wish I'd give you a grand answer, but I know when we do come back, I think we probably will be more health conscious, <laughs> you know, uh, more, uh, you know, focus more on hygiene. Uh, but there, there's something deeper. I just, I just wonder, uh, you know, we've already seen uh, attendance decrease in the SEC, football attendance, even with Alabama. So this could be, this could be the beginning of something much larger in terms of a turning away from sort of traditional sports culture. And, and that could be, you know, problematic. You know, it would be great for eSports and those kind of things. But so we're definitely, we're seeing a fundamental change. But uh, what that's going to look like, I, I, I don't know. We'll soon see. So we'll go to some questions from our audience. Then, but then before we wrap up, we do want to come back to talk about your, your class and, and teaching commentary and such. I think it all ties everything together. but. The, the first question is from, from Ethan Ryder, and, and it touches on your, this, this idea you mentioned about you know, folks going to sporting events as, as, as an act of faith. So some do consider sports as a religion. You know, um, you know, and, and the question that Ethan asks is, so you know, would the government ever shut down a house of worship? Now, a lot of house of worships have been shut down. Catholic, I remember reading about Catholic Diocese in New York and others. But... He asked the question, if they want to shut down a house of worship, why would they shut down sporting events? Well, but see, the, I disagree with his premise. I mean, his premise, I don't see sports as a religion. So I can't even answer that. I mean, because I, I just disagree with the premise that sports is a religion. 
and then short down a house of work. I, mean, I don't. So I, I, I've never seen sports uh, as as a religion. I think it's a big business enterprise. A lot of people are invested uh, in teams, but uh, if, if if sports is your religion, I mean, you can't ask well, who's your god. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know. But so, I, with all due respect, I've never, I, I can't go there because I don't see sports as a religion. So the, the, the next question, and I remembered reading, this is from Josh Ortega, and I remembered reading some stories talking about when they were going to do the games without fans, opened up some opportunities for folks in television to explore different camera angles and that kind of stuff, because they were not about blocking fans. So Josh asked, can the sports media industry use this time to reanalyze how people watch the games, TV rights to blackouts, can we use this as a way to develop new methods to bring the game to people? Well, I think the networks have been doing that anyway. You know, they, they've been studying how do millennials watch games? How, did you, how, do, how can we, how are people digesting our product? Uh, and I, I, oh, I, I just think that these kind of conversations are going around uh, uh, when these games do come back, you know? Uh, and we have, you know, uh, half-filled arenas, and we don't really need fans anymore. How are we going to deliver the product? So, yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, whether it's camera angles or, yeah, I mean, I think they're having those conversations, you know, as we speak about how do we deliver product to people? How are people ingesting our product? The, pro the problem may be is that people may just not be that interested in this enterprise as they once were, you know. Um, uh, we'll, I think we'll see. We'll see um, is the NFL going to be, is, is the NBA, uh, which already had, slumping ratings, you know, how is this going to affect the NBA? Baseball never really recovered from the strike. Uh, the NFL, they say, kind of prints money, but everybody was taking the ratings. So we'll, we'll see, and we'll see. I and mean, it's not clear to me yet that, that the NFL season, we don't know where this is going. <laughs> you know, they, they put a, a date on there. We don't know where this is going. So the, the, the next question I, I think we kind of talked about is from Alexandra uh, Mora Medina. And again, apologies if I mispronounce anyone's name, but why you think there's a lack of diversity in the sports media industry and what we can do to increase diversity. But, um, but uh, Amna, Amna Supan, again, I'm sorry for mispronouncing names, asked what advice you would have for minority sports journalists on getting into the industry? And, or, and if you have other stuff you wanted to add about why you think there's a lack, but, but, but particularly, what advice do you have for minority sports journalists on getting into the industry? I mean, the simple answer is just to, just to grind, find role models, find people who look like you, use social media, you know, use social media to create your brand, you know, break stories. Uh, I mean, use, you know, use what's there, but at some point, you're going to need somebody to open the door for you. You're going to need a sponsor. And how you find a sponsor is, 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 is hard. You've got to be at events. You have to go to events. You have to meet people. Um, you can't s stay in a silo, you know, which, ironically enough, is kind of what we're being pushed in. <laughs> but that's enough. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I know that, you know, you just have to find good sponsors and good mentors. Okay. Um, so the, the, the next question from, um, Randall Hobich, and I apologize, I don't think we'll be able to get to, to everybody's questions, but there's lots of wonderful questions here. Um, but from, um, from Ryan Vlahovich, um, so is now the time for sports journalists to jump over to covering things like Corona or, or other worldly events? I was telling you a story earlier, our, um, our former executive editor here, Kevin Dale, I remember him. Kevin had been the manager at the Denver Post. Before that, he was sports editor at the Denver Post. And he, he I remember him telling a story to my students several years ago when the Aurora Movie Theater shooting happened. First people he sent out were the sports reporters because he, he knew they could deal with, you know, quickly changing, evolving, you know, in, information and such. So do you think it, it's time for, you know, sports journalists? Okay, now let's, you know, spread our wings. I mean, some of them, frankly, are being forced to, but do you think it's time for them to spread their wings in a corona or other worldly events? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, you, now you have to, you're better. Right. You know, but I mean, e every pitcher has got multiple pitches. You know, you just can't do one one thing. It's just like now, you know, journalists here are taught to, in other, in other words, be a, you have to know how to shoot, edit, send. I mean, you have to do 
you have to do a lot of stuff. And that's the same thing in our business. I think you should be fluent in world events and civic events, you know. Uh, and I think the worst thing, if you're just into sports, a lot of things will not make sense to you. <laughs> you know, racism may not make sense to you. Social inequity may not make sense to you. What will make sense to you is, you know, numbers and uh, uh, metrics and who gets, you know, and that ain't the real world. You know, that's not the real world. I, I, I think that just for your own survival and your own just interest, just have more than one pitch. Be interested in, a, in different things. It may just be a, movies and sports or politics. I mean, something else, but not just... When, when I think, you, you know, you touched on something interesting earlier about how, you know, the, the athletes don't, don't need us anymore in the same way, but I think there's also the opportunity here, and it's frankly one of the ways we teach things here at the Cronkite School, is the game story which used to be such a focus of what sports journalists did, isn't as much, isn't much of, a, of a focus anymore. Right. Because, you know, I mean, literally, there's computers generating, generating at some right. point. So folks are following games on Twitter. So the ability to try to provide perspective, like you look at what the folks like The Athletic are doing and such, to really, right. you know, try to delve deeper in those issues is, is, really, is really interesting. And Which is why commentary is important. Yes. You know. Yeah, and, and that's, and actually, that'll, um, so one of your, actually, your current students, I know, is a student of mine, too, Hunter Brownstein, uh, you know, points out, you know, back, back in the day, he says there was a stark difference between sports news and opinion writing. And, and I know you've invested a lot in teaching this, you know, uh, commentary class here at the school. So nowadays, you, you do see more sports journalists speaking their mind, particularly with social media. Um, what do you think about this new era of sports journalism and, and, and where we're going, and particularly in this world of, you know, this 280 character, formerly 140 character, you know, embrace debate culture, one of hot takes, kind of how do you see all this evolving and what, what do you think of the, the direction of the, of the style that, that is within the business? Well, but there's a classic style. You know, I mean, th there's something that's been classic, uh, you know, in 1919, 2019, 20, you know, reporting, opinion. I mean, the hot takes are fine, but... I think that what matters and what's lasting is not is getting people to care about, you know, to care about what you say. You know, it's one thing for you to care about what you say, and and do the hot take in 289. But it's something else to write a thousand word, 1,200 word piece of commentary that people care about because it's reported. You go to the source, um, and you develop a a perspective. That's not what you do in 289. I mean, that's fine to do it in 289 words, but to be a, a person who deals with commentary and insight, uh, it, it, it's just more than it's just more than a hot take. So that's it's fine. It's a it's a nice, I guess it's a nice part of the industry. You know, it's fun. A lot of journalists get a lot of following that way, uh, but I still think at the end of the day, you have to be fundamentally sound and um, you know, and as you get older, you know, as you get older, your perspective will broaden, uh, and, and, and you know, and it, it will change and deepen and widen. Meanwhile, while you're in that process, enjoy Twitter. <laughs> you know, why? <laughs> um, so you were talking about the sides of the few of our themes. You were talking about the, you know, inequality in within sports, sports versus general society, et cetera. So Misha asked, and talking, she says, you know, many are outraged, elite athletes, and athletic personnel, excuse me, seem to get overnight access to COVID-19 tests. I think with the jazz, it was something like 58 tests were done. Right. And, oh, where, where, whereas there were maybe, I think at the time, a few hundred tests in this country or something like that. Um, what impact do you think that frustration will have on viewership attendance when sports, sports do come back? Well, I mean, you know, welcome to wealth and power in the United States. It's not just them, trust me. You know, uh, it's a whole lot of folks, probably, who are getting tested, who are playing, playing private jets to, you know, that's wealth and power. Uh, I guess they, their argument is that with the Jazz, because Toronto was, they had just played the Utah Jazz, and Oklahoma just played the Utah Jazz, so they wanted to test everybody. But, but you know, you, Misha, you know the deal. This, I mean, it's about wealth and power and access and it's not fair you know and and i guess it depends on how outraged you are as a, a as a columnist or to to point 
this out. And you're right, will, will, will there be a backlash when they come back? And say, well, how come, you know, this group of people had access to, you know, the, the, the virus or the serum, and nobody else did? Well, that's what, you know, people like Bernie Sanders, and they talk about, well, that's, it gets to another thing, it's about wealth and power. So, so two kind of final questions for you is, is one is, you know, you, you've talked about, you know, sports has changed, you know, will it come back, will it be the same? And this whole idea of the, the, the wealth gap and the power gap. And so, and you said you've been around sports, we say since 1972, 73. For pay. For pay, yes, exactly, <laughs> right. Um, so why, why continue? Why, why, why cover sports? Um, like what, what do you what do you you know what do you what do you like about it? What what brings you back? You know, it's, I'm not saying it's the only thing I know. I love writing. I love journalism. I love uh, competition. And you couldn't think of like a better a better combination. You know, if if you love to write, and you love to give your opinion, uh, I, I mean, this has been a dream come true. You know. Um, and I still am enthusiastic about it. Uh, it's, 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 it's wonderful. Um, and things like this. I mean, this is, I think it, it's beyond just sports journalism. It's just journalism. These times, as frightening as they are, it's exciting for us you know, as journalists. You know, where everybody is going away from the fire, we go toward the fire. You know, I was in Kansas City. I went to the, I mean, you know, this is what is exciting about our business. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, and, uh, you know, and I can't be a chef, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> And I guess my, my, my final question is, is, you know, we're, we're fortunate to have you here at the Cronkite School and, mm -hmm. and teaching the, the, this class on picking on, uh, you know, thought, you know, crafting thoughtful opinions. So w why did you decide to teach this class? I mean, I've seen, I've, I've been in your class and seen just the energy from the, from the students already drawing from, from you. So why did you decide well, to, it's, to it's, teach the class? Well, A, because people, you know, the typical thing is, well, why don't you teach a class in sports writing? Well, what I've been doing for most of my career, I was a, I was a jazz critic. I've been a sports columnist. That's what I, that's, that's, a, that's what I do, is opinion. And it's a particular certain branch, uh, subset of sports writing. And I also think that most students here have been taught not to have an opinion. They've been taught to be objective, whatever that is. Well, there's something to be said for having a very strong, well-reported, well-thought-out opinion uh, that provides a degree of clarity or at least probability, uh, or at least possibility. You know, I think there's something to be said for, for, for perspective. And so, and, and, and there's nothing to be said that you can't learn it early, you know, um, unfortunately, you'll, not unfortunately, for a better verse, it, 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 being, I think sometimes being a columnist is, is like, you know, you, you plant a tree, you plant that oak tree in, in your backyard, and you can go and water that tree every single day, 89 times a day, and it's not going to grow any faster, you know, in fact, you'll probably kill it. It just takes time, it just takes time. Now, in the process of that time, is what, what do you do in the process of that tree growing? Well, you get wisdom, you, you, you read, you expand your vision, you make contacts, uh, you get perspective. So, uh, and it's been exciting to, uh, uh, to engage with the students and say, well, you know, opinion, opinion isn't everything you thought it was. It's not just, A, sitting down and say, I think, it, but it's thinking. It's thinking, reporting, and expanding, so, and I love it. Well, Bill, thank you. This is a pleasure for me. I think I said when we spoke last year, you know, I had, for a long time, been reading your columns, and, you know, to get started and have this conversation with you and share it with our, with our virtual audience has been fantastic. Thank you to the audience for, for watching both the live stream and then mm. as you watch the recording. Well, and we, we need uh, you we here. appreciate it, Bill. <laughs> yes. We look forward to, uh, to welcoming uh, everyone back at a, at a in the future and certainly welcoming sports back. Uh, hopefully not to in the future. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you, guys. Yeah, no, we, we, can we pipe in, like, applause, like, yeah. the roar of the crowd? Yeah. That's what you have to do for the next one. You have to have the roar of the crowd. Yeah. You know? The next one is all going to be on Zoom. Are we, are we clear, by the way? Yeah, yeah. Great. Thank you.
Um, cool. Well, thank you, Bill. That was great. And there's things we didn't get to, and that was great. That was a lot of fun.